Hi, and welcome back to my series of videos for General Chemistry 2. Today, I want to tell you a little about acids and bases. You've used acids plenty of times in chemistry labs, and even if you've never been in a chemistry lab, you probably have a pretty good idea of what an acid is like. You know that some acids can be used to dissolve metals, and that acids are found in your stomach where they help to digest food. But you probably also know that not all acids are so corrosive. For example, you're familiar with citric acid, and you may also know that proteins are all made from amino acids. So acids are very common in foods and are needed for human health. There's definitely a big difference between these acids and the ones that we use to dissolve metals in the lab. What makes the difference between strong acids like those and weak acids like the ones found in foods and carbonated soda? It turns out that it's not just a matter of how concentrated the acid is. Actually, to understand why some acids are more corrosive than others, we need to use what we've learned in the past few videos about reversible reactions. If you haven't seen those, this might be a good time to review them, especially video 15, which was our introduction to reversible reactions, and video 18, where we talked about Le Chatelier's principle. But first, let's talk a little about acids and what they look like. Here are three examples of acids, a couple of which you've probably seen before. The first of these you've definitely seen before. It's acetic acid, which is a liquid at room temperature. You might also think that HCl is a liquid, since you've seen hydrochloric acid in lab many times, but HCl is actually a gas at room temperature. The hydrochloric acid you've used in class is actually HCl gas dissolved in water. Even HCl solutions that are very high concentration are mostly water. The last compound is titanium 4 chloride. You probably haven't seen this one in class, and for a very good reason. It's a very strong acid, even stronger than HCl. So strong that instead of dissolving in water, it'll actually react with the water. Just opening the bottle will show you how powerful an acid it is. The vapor you see is a result of the titanium chloride reacting with moisture in the air. This titanium 4 chloride is a solid. So we've seen examples of acids that are a liquid, a gas, and a solid. So acids can have any of those three phases. And although they can be very corrosive, like the titanium chloride and HCl, they don't have to be. So what is it that makes an acid an acid in the first place? There have been several definitions of what an acid or base is. The one most people have heard of was given by the chemist Svante Arrhenius, who we first talked about in video 13 when we were talking about reaction rates. Arrhenius noticed that the acids he studied produced hydrogen ions, H+, in water, and the bases produced hydroxide ions, OH-, in water. Compounds that obey those definitions are called Arrhenius acids and Arrhenius bases. You might already have noticed that one of the examples we looked at a minute ago, titanium chloride, doesn't obey this definition because it reacts with water instead of dissolving in it. Even so, this definition of acids and bases is useful, and lots of the most common acids and bases we use in general chem obey it. For example, here's salicylic acid, which you've seen if you took my lab course for general chemistry 1. At room temperature, it's a solid but it dissolves in water according to this reaction. One of the products is H plus ion, so salicylic acid obeys the Arrhenius definition of an acid. Here's another compound you've used in lab before. It's sodium hydroxide, also known as lye. You're probably used to thinking of it as a liquid, but actually sodium hydroxide is a solid, and it dissolves in water according to this reaction. As you can see, it produces hydroxide ions in water, so it satisfies the Arrhenius definition of a base. Unfortunately, as we saw earlier, there are several acids and bases that don't meet the Arrhenius definition, so a more accurate definition was needed. That was done in 1923 by two chemists, Johannes Bronsted of Denmark and Thomas Lowry of the United Kingdom. According to their definition, an acid is any compound that donates an H plus ion in an acid-base reaction. And a base is any compound that accepts an H plus ion in an acid-base reaction. As we'll soon see, these turn out to be much more useful definitions of acids and bases. Compounds that obey these definitions are called Bronsted-Lowry acids and Bronsted-Lowry bases. For example, here are the acid and base we used as examples just a moment ago. 
If you look closely at the reaction, you can see that this molecule donates a hydrogen to the sodium hydroxide. That makes this a Bronsted-Lowry acid. Meanwhile, the sodium hydroxide accepts the hydrogen, which makes it a Bronsted-Lowry base. You might recall that earlier we said that this molecule, salicylic acid, is an Arrhenius acid, and sodium hydroxide is an Arrhenius base. And now we've just seen that they're also a Bronsted-Lowry acid and Bronsted-Lowry base. This will always be true. Anything that meets the Arrhenius definition for acids and bases will also satisfy the Bronsted-Lowry definition. But the Bronsted-Lowry definition is a better one because it'll also catch some acids and bases that don't meet the Arrhenius definition. There are a couple of other things to know about reactions like this before we move on. First of all, let's look at the products. After the acid gives away its hydrogen atom, the resulting product is called the conjugate base. Also, after the base accepts the hydrogen, the molecule that results is called the conjugate acid. Let's look at a couple more examples. Suppose we combine hydrochloric acid and water. The acid donates a hydrogen to water, which accepts it. That makes the HCl, a Brunsted-Lowry acid, and the water, a Bronsted-Lowry base. The products are chloride ion and H3O+, which is called a hydronium ion. Remember, after the acid has donated a hydrogen ion, what's left is called the conjugate base. So in this case, that's the chloride ion. Meanwhile, the base has accepted the hydrogen ion, and the hydronium that results is the conjugate acid. Now, here's a reaction between ammonia and water. This time, the water donates a hydrogen to the ammonia, so that makes water the acid and ammonia the base. After the water donates the hydrogen, all that's left is a hydroxide ion, so that's the conjugate base. And the ammonium ion is the conjugate acid. But wait, we just saw a couple of interesting things that you may have missed in these two reactions. First, notice that water acted as a Bronsted-Lowry base in the first reaction and as an acid in the second reaction. A substance that can act as both an acid and a base, depending on what it's reacting with, is said to be amphoteric. The second thing to notice is very subtle, but also very important. Look at the reaction arrows in these two reactions. The first reaction has a single arrow, which means it's an irreversible reaction. But the second one is a reversible reaction. That means that all the reactant molecules in this first reaction will react until one of them runs out. The products won't come back together and give us back our starting material. On the other hand, in the reversible reaction, some of the products will recombine to give us back some of the reactant molecules. So, all the HCl molecules react to form hydronium and chloride. That makes hydrochloric acid a strong acid. On the other hand, here is a reversible reaction in which salicylic acid forms hydronium and salicylate ions. This one is a reversible reaction, which means that some of the product ions will react and give us back the reactants. So unlike the case with HCl, there's never a time when all of the acid molecules react to form products. That makes salicylic acid a weak acid. The same ideas are true for bases. In this case, all the sodium hydroxide molecules break up to form sodium and hydroxide, so that makes it a strong base. On the other hand, when ammonia reacts with water, it's a reversible reaction. So some of the ammonium and hydroxide ions will recombine to form the reactants again. That makes ammonia a weak base. It turns out that most acids and bases are weak. In fact, there are so few strong acids and bases that I'm going to tell you what all of the important ones are. Knowing which acids and bases are strong and which are weak will turn out to be useful in the discussions we'll have in the next part of the course, so you want to try to remember this list as soon as you can. As you'll see, it's actually not too hard to remember. The only common strong acids are nitric acid, sulfuric acid, perchloric acid, hydrochloric acid, hydrobromic acid, 
and hydroiodic acid. Notice that the last three of these are just hydrogen combined with one of these three atoms of the periodic table. That should help make them easier to remember. And that's it. If you know these six acids, you know all of the common strong acids. Every other acid that you ever see in our course will be a weak acid. The list of strong bases is a little longer, but still pretty short. The strong bases are lithium hydroxide, sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, rubidium hydroxide, cesium hydroxide, calcium hydroxide, strontium hydroxide, barium hydroxide, and radium hydroxide. That seems like a rather long list, but if you look at the periodic table, you'll notice that all of these are just hydroxides of metals in the first two columns of the periodic table, which makes them much easier to remember. You might be wondering why francium hydroxide isn't also a strong base. In fact, it probably is a strong base, but it's so very rare and radioactive that it isn't possible to study it well enough to be sure. You'll want to try and remember this list of strong acids and strong bases as soon as possible. That's a big order, so that's enough new material for today. In the next video, we'll start looking at practical applications of everything we've learned about acids and bases. Acids and bases are everywhere in nature, and in our homes, our food, and in the drugs and pharmaceuticals we use. There aren't very many topics more important in chemistry than acids and bases, so we'll spend a few more videos talking about them. So until next time, have a good week!